the future of flight. A look at the high-tech, energy-efficient airplanes of tomorrow. Is this the thickness of the fuselage of the plane? Yeah, absolutely. It's almost like blue jean material. And the fuel to power them. So this little seed has in it oil. The, yeah. the makings of jet fuel. That's right. Daytona, NASCAR's Super Bowl. This year, the green flag means greener racing. We were to experience more horsepower, cleaner burns, um, you know, and a cleaner burning engine for the environment. And an interview with Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood. Can America change its gas guzzling ways? This is Energy Now. Hello, I'm Thalia Shuras. Welcome to Energy Now a weekly look at America's energy challenges and what we're doing about them. On this week's show, we focus on planes, trains and automobiles and how much energy transportation consumes. First, fasten your seatbelts for a look at the future of flight. Of all the carbon dioxide humans emit, about 2% comes from planes. And since that's deposited at high altitudes, its effect on the climate is magnified. There are some staggering numbers. According to the U.S. Department of Transportation, last year more than 11 billion gallons of jet fuel were used to move nearly 787 million passengers through the air in the United States alone. With passenger air traffic set to double every 15 years, the industry is at a crossroads. Energy Now's Josh Zepps shows us how the folks who design the planes of the future are getting creative in this Energy Now Spotlight. If you need a zero carbon emission car, or boat, or train, that ain't rocket science. You just find an alternative fuel. But if you need a source of energy so concentrated that it can blast a one million pound aircraft into the sky, then, well, frankly, that is rocket science. For the future of aviation, I think I'm in the right place. The world is on the brink of an aviation revolution. Within the next few years, you'll be flying on planes that are radically more efficient than ever before in ways you notice and in ways you don't. The ultimate goal is a commercially viable passenger plane with a carbon footprint of zero. To learn about the energy efficient planes of the future, I headed to NASA's Langley Air and Space Research Center in Virginia. I think NASA could use some bigger doors and tracked down Faye Collier, head of the Environmentally Responsible Aviation Unit. In terms of uh, aircraft efficiency, um, you, you want to look at three things. Uh, essentially, you want to look at weight reduction. Uh, you want to you look at drag reduction. And you want to look at improving uh, the propulsive efficiency of, of the power plant, the propulsion system. In other words, planes that are light, sleek, and powerful. The best way to make them light is to ditch all that metal. Despite endless production delays, Boeing's new 787 Dreamliner should soon be the first aircraft not made out of metal since... Well, since planes were things you didn't much want to fly in anyway. The 787 is made out of carbon fibre composite material. Basically, it's 80% plastic. And the technology is moving so fast that already NASA has an even newer composite that's 10% lighter than the 787s and 25 to 30% lighter than aluminum. Uh, they call it the, Perseus. Uh, first of all, Perseus stands for protruded rod, stitched efficient unitized structure. Protruded rod. Pull, pull truded. P U L. P U L. Mm -hmm. Pull truded rod. Yeah. Stitched efficient structure. Uni unitized structure. That's what I said. Yes. Unitized structure. Yeah, exactly. Well, whatever you want to call it, it's one of the world's most advanced materials. Um, I mean, one thing that strikes me about this is not only is it very, very light, it's extremely thin. I mean, is that is this the thickness of the fuselage uh, of the plane? Yeah, absolutely. It's almost like blue jean material. This rod, is that's the same rod that you use in your tents. That's what this material is here. So it's a solid. And this, mm -hmm. and this other stuff is more like a piece of cloth. A very, very tough piece of cloth. Yes, exactly. A piece of cloth so tough, in fact, they've already made a plane out of it. This is the prototype X-48B. As you can see, it's not just lighter than existing passenger planes, it's a whole lot sleeker too. So the difference between the tube and wing and the hybrid wing body is the blending of the fuselage and the wings and we get a, you know, a much better and more efficient shape uh, in, in doing so because of the way the lift um, is, is distributed That's across right. the aircraft. It may herald a generation of passenger aircraft that are no longer built by bolting a couple of wings to a tube, 
but by using the whole surface of the aircraft as one giant wing thing. More lift means you need less fuel to lift it. All right, let's stop the bleed. NASA invited me to witness these aerodynamic advantages firsthand at a live wind tunnel test. Take the data, point 800. 799 is the point of weight. I have no idea what they're talking about. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to see that huge strides are being made. But if the ultimate goal is a climate-friendly plane, and oil is still the only energy source with the punch to get us airborne, then even the most efficient planes will still be carbon-spewing villains, right? Not necessarily. So this little seed has in it... Oil. ...the, yeah. the makings of jet fuel. That's right. <laughs> Incredible. At the Greenland facility at NASA Glen in Cleveland, Ohio, Dan Bolzen is producing plants that could produce the fuel for the lighter, sleeker planes of the future. What we're trying to do here is improve the, um, the oil content of the plants themselves. We're hoping to produce oil that's a little more suitable for further processing into jet fuel. Now, this is a salicornia. It's very salt tolerant. Mm -hmm. And you can see it's grown in kind of a sand medium. Okay, so it's a sort of a marshy kind of plant? Yeah, yeah, it grows uh, in, you know, coastal areas, uh, areas where other food crops would not grow. That is important. Algae and halophytes, or salt water plants, can be planted along coastlines or even offshore. Biofuels derived from crops, from farmland where there would have been plants anyway, don't suck up any extra carbon at all. These plants do. When I think about the life cycle of the fuel that we currently use in aviation, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago animals died, they then got compressed into oil, into fossil fuels, which we then drill out of the ground and we use for one time only burning it in, in aviation. Here, I'm feeding seaweed to fish who will poo it out to feed plants from which we'll extract oil, which will then burn in aviation fuel. So really we could be powering planes on seaweed. Is that fair to say? You could say that. NASA is keen to emphasize that it is early days and a lot of research still needs to be done. But biofuels have fans in high places, like Bill Glover, Vice President of Environmental and Aviation Policy at Boeing. We have proven over the last uh, three years or so that that's not only feasible, it is absolutely doable, and it gives us as good or even better fuel because now we design in the characteristics that we want rather than just deriving the characteristics from what's in a, a barrel of petroleum. Lifting hundreds of millions of gallons of gas 34,000 feet into the air every day is not cheap. According to the Air Transport Association, the expected fuel bill for global commercial aviation this year alone will be a whopping $39 billion. Fuel efficiency, CO2 efficiency, is really in the DNA of every product that we make. I don't know when it will be, but I don't see really any reason why we couldn't have a totally green aircraft uh, at some point in the future. When that day comes, thanks to lighter materials, more aerodynamic designs and cleaner propulsion, let's just hope that airlines have also found a way to bring back in-flight pillows. At NASA Glen in Cleveland, Ohio, Josh Zepps, Energy Now. Actually, I don't know about you, but I sure miss those pillows. By the way, the Federal Aviation Administration has its radar set on energy savings and lower emissions by focusing on more direct landings and flight paths. It's looking at next gen a system that uses satellite rather than radar navigation. Satellites will allow controllers to plot direct flight paths and to eliminate inefficient landing approaches. You know, that circling the airport until the plane can land. The FAA estimates it could save 1.4 billion gallons of aviation fuel and cut 14 million tons of CO2 through 2018 by using NextGen. So just how much CO2 goes into the air when you fly? Let's find out. We're using the carbon dioxide emissions calculator from the International Civil Aviation Organization. Now let's say you fly once a month from Washington's Reagan National Airport to Los Angeles, about 4,600 miles round trip. That equals more than eight and a half tons of carbon dioxide a year. Add that up, 12 flights emit about the same carbon as one year's worth of electricity used in the average home. Next, we'll take a look at what's happening on the ground. We'll talk with Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood about whether America's gasoline-guzzling culture can ever be changed. I think the American people will really begin to look at electrified automobiles as a way to save gasoline, particularly as it continues to go up. 
again, racing toward the finish line and the future. NASCAR pit stops are pumping a new kind of racing fuel. But first, some bloggers weigh in on biofuels. Biofuels for ground transportation is probably way more realistic at this point in time than for air transportation. There is a lot of interest in air, particularly from the U.S. military and from companies like Richard Branson's Virgin Airlines. If you're looking at the long-term viability of biofuels as a realistic option for the country, I think you have to look at two main realities. You have to look at the economic uh, viability of whether it's something that's going to be able to get scaled up. And then, of course, you have to look at the climate reality, which is, do we have a fuel that is going to do greater benefit than it is harm in the long term? adopt a child from foster care. Just being there makes all the difference. So here are the keys. Congratulations, it's officially yours. I'm sure you'll have many happy years here. Except for you, because you'll be gone three years from now, struck down by the same disease that got your father. So you won't be around for them. And sadly, it could have been detected early with a simple test, but you didn't have it. Okay, who wants to check out the backyard? For a list of tests every man should have, go to AHRQ.gov. That's why today I'm directing agencies to, pur uh, to purchase 100% alternative fuel, hybrid, or electric vehicles by 2015. All of them should be alternative fuel. That was President Obama in March directing the government to get behind alternative energy vehicles in its fleets. He also reiterated his call for a million electric vehicles on the roads by 2015. Recently, I sat down with Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood and asked him how that target could be met, since less than 3,000 of the new EVs have been sold in the U.S. so far. Well, look, with gas prices as high as they are, I think people uh, are, are going to become more accustomed to looking at alternatives uh, for their automobiles. The president gets it. I think that's why the president has said that we need alternative forms of transportation, whether it's electrification of cars or high-speed rail or uh, other opportunities uh, to save gasoline. Uh, we know that people are, are hurting right now uh, with these high gasoline prices. And I, I think the American people will really begin to look at electrified automobiles as a way to save gasoline, particularly as it continues to go up. But embracing them is another thing. They're expensive, their batteries are not ready for prime time, there's range anxiety, which is, you know, running out of juice while you're on the road. It's got to be tough. You know, look, at it, this is a very uh, tough economy, and people are looking for every way that they can to save money. And if they can save money as gasoline prices go up, I think what the president and this administration has promoted is the idea that when you buy an electrified car, for example, if you buy the Volt, you get $7,800 tax credit. That's a, that's a lot of money to people, and that's a way for people to buy an electrified automobile, a battery-powered car, if you will, save a lot of money for the high price of gasoline, uh, and then really begin to get into the, the kind of automobile that uh, we're hoping that people will do, uh, not only to clean up the air, but to save uh, on, on high prices for gas. All right, get into, in the meantime, it's still a gasoline culture. There are high prices in gasoline. So how does a country fill in the gap until electric comes into play? Does that mean more offshore drilling for What oil? it means for this administration, and certainly for transportation, is we're continuing to pr promote high-speed rail. Other forms of transportation, uh, whether it's uh, transit, mass transit, buses, uh, I, I was just in Portland. We're promoting uh, streetcars that are made in America. Still driving their cars, though, and still needing gasoline. So what do you do on the energy level? Well, we, we, we're gonna, we've worked very hard on CAFE standards. That's the standard that's set by DOT and EPA to get higher gasoline mileage. We've got a standard now for 2012, which is 26 miles per gallon. 2016 is 35 miles per gallon. And now we're working on standards that'll take us beyond 2017. 
Well, you brought up high-speed rail several times, and I'd, I'd like to ask you about that because, again, the president wants 80 percent of Americans to have access to high-speed trains within 25 years. How do we catch up to the rest of the world? And, and I have to quote some numbers here because here in the U.S., the Acela is the fastest train. It doesn't have a dedicated track. It averages 68 miles per hour, top speed 150. France, average speed for bullet trains is 134 miles per hour, top speed 200. And you have China, and it averages 120 miles per hour. Hour, a high of 220 miles per hour. Why is this country so far behind the others? Because we've never made the investment. The big vision that President Obama has is to connect 80 percent of America in the next 25 years with high-speed rail. In California, you'll have trains running over 200 miles an hour because we're going to build new infrastructure. Think of how many cars will be taken off the road. Think about how much gasoline will be saved. Think about how much CO2 uh, how much greener the, the air will be in California. In Illinois, you'll have a train from Chicago to St. Louis in a little over two hours. It's now a six-hour drive from Chicago to St. Louis. Uh, again, hundreds and thousands of cars off the road, a greener, cleaner air. That's why President Obama's pushing high-speed rail as an alternative uh, to automobiles. How do you actually make it happen? How uh, uh, you as a Secretary of Transportation, your department, make it happen? What can you do and what can't you do? when you have states making their own decisions, localities making their own decisions. It's not just up to you. No, and, and, and I'm proud to say that there are at least uh, 30 plus areas in the country that have accepted uh, money for high-speed rail. They've accepted it freely, voluntarily. They want it. And as Florida and Ohio and Wisconsin said they didn't want it, I had people lined up outside my door here at DOT really wanting to get into the high-speed rail business. Well, let me ask you about cleaning up the air, because your department says that with high-speed rail, the country would reduce oil use by 125 million barrels per year. Yet this country uses almost 20 million barrels per day of oil. So it doesn't really, it sounds like just a, a drop in the bucket, reduction. Well, you couple, you couple uh, high-speed rail with more transit, which we're doing, more streetcars, which we're doing, more light rail, higher cafe standards. It's a combination of a lot of different things. Giving people a tax rebate if they buy an electrified automobile. You couple all these things together, you begin to save a lot of uh, gasoline. You save people's, uh, bill, uh, their pocketbook uh, that, that, that they have to pay uh, in order to pay for the, the high price of gasoline. And coupled together, it's a total plan that the president has and a big vision the president has uh, to create lots of alternatives so we can relieve our dependence on crude oil. But are you going to be able to handle that spike just by changing transit or does there have to be more domestic oil production in this country? Well, our job here at DOT and the President's vision for transportation is to create many different options for people. The Department of Energy and the Department of Interior we will work with on opportunities uh, which will include uh, looking at uh, production of oil. But what we're focused on here and what the president is focused on when it comes to transportation, high-speed rail, cafe standards, uh, electrified cars, all of the things that we've talked about to give people all the options they need to cut down their use on gasoline and uh, to help uh, their, uh, their bottom line, so to speak, as they uh, you know, have their own budgets to deal with. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your time. Thank you. Now back to electric vehicles for a minute. Sure, they're a hot topic these days, but they were also all the rage decades ago. Take a look at this electric car show on Capitol Hill from 1967. In this energy then. A special kind of automobile show in the Senate garage on Capitol Hill. They all look like conventional cars, but they have one major difference. Their power supply is electric. Smooth, silent, economical, with no gasoline fumes from the exhaust, the electric automobile will help in the battle against air pollution in the cities. The batteries are rechargeable overnight. So, maybe there's an Edison in your future. Now, one of the cars in that newsreel, the Yardney Silver Cell, was developed by Yardney Electric. The car used two silver zinc batteries and could reach speeds of up to 50 miles an hour. A meter would tell the driver how much battery power was left after a spin.
Still ahead, one of America's most beloved sports is getting greener. NASCAR is shifting gears to ethanol power. That story when Energy Now returns. My joints ache so bad, I wake up in pain every day. I want to know why. I want to know why my hair is falling out. How did this happen? How did this happen? A little pain in my knee. That's how it started. That's how it started. This rash on my face, now it's like my body is attacking me. I want answers. When you don't have the right answers, it may be time to ask your doctor the right question. Could I have lupus? Racing cars doesn't look, sound, or smell like quiet farm life. It's all about engines screaming around a track, gulping down gas, and spitting out fumes. But black soil is reaching black asphalt in a new way. NASCAR is now being fueled by corn-based ethanol. Proponents say such biofuels, generally made from crops and recycled agricultural waste, will help reduce dependence on foreign oil and support the rural economy. So Energy Now's Lee Patrick Sullivan went to the Daytona 500 for a look at how auto racing is taking charge of its energy future. Drivers, start your engines! NASCAR, the speed, the crowds, the corn-based biofuels? Do you know that Jeff Gordon's car is going to have uh, biofuels in it? What's that? It's E15. A blend of 15% corn ethanol to go into the mix of racing fuel. The E15 switch is part of a plan by NASCAR to be more green. But environmental motivations aside, the fuel still has to perform on the track. Will it? Remember, millions of NASCAR fans come to see fast cars. The only green they're concerned with is the green flag that starts the race. Before we saw it pumped into those highly tuned race machines, we went to Philadelphia. That's where Sunoco blends more than 70,000 gallons of E15 racing fuel that NASCAR will use this year. The folks at Sunoco have been working on this special blend for more than two years. Our big challenge here for NASCAR was to get the fuel from here to tracks all over the United States and to make sure that as we transferred the fuel that it's a closed system that there's no chance of the fuel picking up any water because that would cause an ethanol-based fuel to separate at a certain level. Separation is bad, really bad. It can stop a vehicle dead in its tracks. So the folks at Sunoco are now handling the distribution of this fuel differently than in the years past. In an effort to keep water and other contaminants out of the fuel, it will no longer be stored in underground fiberglass tanks at the various tracks across the country. That's because ethanol erodes most older fiberglass tanks. Instead, it will be trucked in for every race. That wasn't their only challenge. They also had to come up with a new fuel can. And here at the Daytona 500, the new and improved can made its debut. The addition of this hose right here and a couple other valves keep moisture out. Why am I so concerned with the new gas cans? Well, it's the only visible sign that NASCAR fans will see once the E15 switch has been made. Also, my cousin has to lift these things. That's him right there. He's the gas man for driver Denny Hamlin. Hey, cuz. Hey. Hey, Scott, how you doing? Good, how are you? So how are those new gas cans working out? Well, it's a lot better than we expected. I mean, uh, we've done a lot of practice and everything, and, and uh, we feel pretty good about it. Now, I remember us being kids and you, you working on your Mustang in your dad's garage. Did you think in 2011 you'd be working on a race car that had biofuels in it made from corn? Oh, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> not. I'm sure I would have, uh, I, you know, it's just only been recently I've ever even heard of bio, biofuels. <laughs> but uh, 
Back when I was working on my Mustang, I thought I was going to be a driver. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't care what was in the tank, right? <laughs> no, absolutely. Now, for those of you who think that race cars just won't perform well with biofuels, well, here at the world's most famous racetrack, they've been running on ethanol since 2005. And here at Indy, it's not a blend. All cars race on 100% sugarcane ethanol from Brazil. We have high performance, high horsepower race cars can run on 100% fuel grade ethanol. Surely you should have the confidence in your passenger car to at least run on a blend. The difference is these Indy cars are tuned specifically for ethanol. Most passenger cars are not. Cars that are labeled as flex fuel are the exception. They can switch back and forth between pure gasoline and 85% ethanol. It goes together smoothly. And speaking of switching back and forth, driver Sarah Fisher wears two different hats. I mean, helmets. She's one of the few drivers who is also an owner. Now we've talked to the suits mm -hmm. and we've talked to the ethanol makers, but you actually drive these things. Mm -hmm. uh, what's it like driving with ethanol? Well, driving with ethanol compared to methanol, you know, there there hasn't been a really big shift in power. There hasn't been a really big shift in, in durability or efficiency. Uh, the only difference is smell. Back in Daytona, the first race with E15 is about 24 hours away, and we caught up with driver Clint Boyer. NASCAR was reluctant to even switch from leaded to unleaded, but it seems like you went from unleaded to ethanol rather rather quickly. Yeah, it was a you know fairly uh, easy step too. You know, one would think that it was going to take extreme measures and a lot of changes, very difficult to be able to figure out how to use it, and it was, it was very minimal. Um, and actually, it was a gain. You know, come to find out, we were we experienced more horsepower, cleaner burns, um, you know, and a cleaner burning engine for the environment and everything else. So this has been a win-win for everybody involved. The result? Some of the fastest time trials in Daytona 500 history. A fact that didn't surprise General Wesley Clark, who now co-chairs the ethanol advocacy group, Growth Energy. We had always heard unofficially that at E20, E30, there's really no drop-off in, in mileage, and there's a potential for a big boost in performance. Most of the race experts I spoke with say the faster times had more to do with the Daytona International Speedway resurfacing their track. But the ethanol people are getting their message out to the heartland. Did you know that this is the first year they'll be running biofuels in the cars? Yes, I did. And what do you think about that? Uh, I think it's a fantastic thing and it's about time and I wish we had it in more regular cars. In Daytona Beach, Florida, Lee Patrick Sullivan, Energy Now. And that's it for this week's Energy Now. If you have any questions for upcoming guests, let us know. Upload your video questions or remarks to our YouTube channel, Energy Now News. Give us your name, please, and where you're from, and please keep the remarks short, less than 30 seconds. You can also friend us on Facebook, join our discussion pages, or follow us on Twitter. Search them all at Energy Now News. I'm Thalia Schurz. I'll see you next week.